Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Progress Channel. Good God, I almost said Renaissance Periodization. Video number 33 in our hopefully long-lasting series of random topics. This one is in the subcategory of policy. Proposal. America should police the world. That's right. I'm advocating America policing the world. What a crazy idea. And no, I'm not being sarcastic. And yes, I really do mean this. And to preempt potentially very many comments, yes, I have thought it through to an incredible extent. Maybe I'm just not that smart and my idea of incredible sucks. Why don't you tune in for a little while and see what I mean? See if you can disagree. Eight things to talk about. First, the spectrum of country types that we have in the world that may need some fucking policing, damn it. What I would call, uh, I would term the modern alliance actually is, of which America is the most powerful member. Why national sovereignty is important, and maybe why one world government sort of no nations thing is a little bit premature. What the boundaries are for national sovereignty, aka what countries should and should not be able to do themselves. Why global security in general is important, probably the most important reason that we need a sort of global police force. The universals for security intervention, basically what gets you kiboshed if you're doing it wrong. And a proposed model by me, yours truly, of how to handle global security, and lastly, the implications of such a thing. So apologies in advance, America was clickbait. What I mean is not America itself, although it is the biggest uh, actor in this space. What I mean is modern countries. What are those? Let's talk about the spectrum of country types. All nations on this earth fall somewhere between what I would term developing nations and modern nations. I use the term modern because developed means there's a finality, that they've arrived at something. And uh, that's not really the case because every country is always progressing at different rates. And um, modern means it's up to the modern current standard, but modernity is a constantly updating standard, gets better and better over time. Another way to see modern is, quote, adopts most of current best practices in how to run a nation. And yes, there are current best practices that are essentially universal, unless you think like high pollution and high crime are a good thing and extreme poverty is awesome. In that case, you're arguing for, you know, an interesting place to live that probably no one really agrees with you on. So what are developing countries more like than modern countries? Typically, developing countries have lower rule of law. When the state has lots of power in a situation of low rule of law, that means there's often a high degree of corruption. So the state can do things, but people are paid off, and so they turn a blind eye or just do whatever the fuck they want. There's a high abuse of power. So the premier just does fuck all, and everyone can suck a dick because who gives a shit? He's the guy with the guns. And oftentimes, there's a lot of procedural violation with minimal or no transparency. People are sentenced to jail for crimes that are giant question marks through procedures that are also giant question marks. And, well, there's no free press because the government will beat you up or throw you off a rooftop if you decide to become a member of the, quote, free press. When the state has little power and there's low rule of law, you get things like armed militia groups uh, acting unopposed internally. That happens currently occurring in Yemen as, as I make this presentation. A failure to enforce basic laws against theft, murder, sexual assault, etc. Real bad time. People having a worse time than they could be having. Another feature of uh, less developed countries is that they have typically lower economic freedom, which means they often have low property rights. Um, What you think is yours may turn out not to be yours when the government or someone wealthier or more connected than you decides it belongs to them. They often have over-regulated economies. One of the best examples of this is the nation of India. Feel free to Google India's economic regulations if you want to throw up for a long time. They often have terrible economic growth compared to what's possible. One of the highest IQ nations in the world, just genetically smarter people than almost everywhere, is North Korea, except it's seen negative economic growth for seemingly its entire history. Very extreme example, but Every country lives up to its potential to some extent or not, and typically countries that are lower in development uh, don't live up to their potential growth rate nearly as much because of their lower economic freedom. And I will say underdeveloped countries with a high economic freedom typically don't stay underdeveloped for long. A great example of this over the last 20 or 30 years is Thailand, 
which is a very reasonably high level of economic freedom. It started out very poor 30 years ago and now is like doing very well and better all the time. And lastly, most of this ends up getting to the point where there's just lower standards of living across the board in places that are less economically free. Another feature of uh, less developed countries is typically lower social freedom than modern countries, lower religious freedom, sexual freedom, freedom of speech, press, music, art, etc. Go talk that shit in Iran and see where that gets you, probably thrown off a rooftop. Frequently, these places have despotic governments who often start violence with internal groups, Saddam Hussein slaughtering the Kurds, uh, or just with other countries, Saddam Hussein trying to go after Kuwait, great double, uh, double example right away. Oftentimes, to prove to you that I'm not a stark, raving, mad, anarcho-capitalist libertarian all the time, these lower developed countries have lower what's called state capacity, which means their governments suck at almost everything. Luckily, for the rest of the free and modern world, they even suck at war, so they're usually really bad at taking over other countries and making them also suck. Examples of these countries include, but are not limited to, Iran, North Korea, Cuba, fortunately much of Sub-Saharan Africa, Myanmar, Yemen, etc. Places that if you want to go visit, the CIA and the State Department typically tell you that's not a good idea for quite obvious reasons like you could die or if you decide to bribe the cop with the wrong amount of money, you could just disappear and we can't get you back. Shit like that. Now, on the opposite end of the spectrum are countries that are much more modern. And they typically have higher rule of law, which means that when the state has lots of power, they have very low corruption, like you see in the Nordic countries, low abuse of power typically. And I don't mean no abuse of power. So if you decide to get in the comments and say, but in Sweden, we have our own problems, that's nice. Go to Afghanistan and see how you like the problems there, right? It's all relative and we could all do better. There is no perfect country. But typically, modern countries are just better at all these things. Better, not the best they could be. And lastly, they stick to typically stick to procedure with lots of transparency. In the United States, if someone gets sued in court, typically a lot of people find out about exactly what it is that's happening. It's very well tabulated. It's a very public. Journalists have tons of access. And there's not really any situation, or sorry, very many situations, certainly not as many as in Iran, for example, in which shit just happens and people go to jail and no one knows why and you just shut up about it, right? Lots of transparency is a great thing. When the state has little power, not so much power, as in, for example, the rural areas of Montana, armed citizens are peaceful and help reduce crime via deterrence. You can try to break into someone's house in Montana, but your ass is probably getting shot to death, so you probably wouldn't be doing it, so it's a very peaceful place to be. And there are minimal laws in these places that most people can follow with ease, just enough laws to keep the economy and society growing well and prosperity to keep coming to everyone. Next, more modern countries typically have higher levels of economic freedom, which means they have very strictly enforced property rights. They have intelligently and minimally regulated economies. They have awesome economic growth compared to what's possible with all their given resources and all the other inputs. And they have higher standards of living across the board. Again, if you go to Switzerland, there's not that many poor people. If you go to India, it's almost all poor people by the global standard. Big difference. Next. More modern countries have typically much higher degrees of social freedom. So in a place like the Netherlands, you have a really high degree of religious freedom, sexual freedom. Like if you're gay or straight or trans or up or down, nobody gives a shit. Try that shit in Syria. Won't go very far. High degree of freedom of speech, freedom of the press. If you say something bad about the president in the United States, it's a Tuesday. If you say something bad about the president in Russia, you may find yourself in a participant in the new sport of unassisted rooftop jumping, maybe assisted by FSB agents, I guess. Music, art, etc., are all just much more tolerated in these kinds of nations. And typically, these kinds of nations have very peaceful governments that almost never start violence outside of defensive war. And if you want to bring up Iraq and Afghanistan with the United States, you'll have to contend the fact that those wars would not have happened had 9-11 not occurred. Now, with those wars, the proper response to 9-11 is a very debatable point, but it wouldn't have happened unless the oh, motherfuckers attacked us first, you feel what I'm saying. Does that mean that modern nations never start wars? Absolutely not. 
but they start them a lot less than developing nations. Just a statistical reality. Feel free to look into in your own time. Lastly, typically, modern nations have a higher state capacity to their governments. That means their governments still usually don't do things as well as markets do things because markets are just usually better at stuff. Not everything, but most things, as evidenced by reality. But compared to other governments, they do them at at least basic competence. They're at least okay, not totally derelict. For example, if you want to go uh, to Norway and get a business license or driver's license, you want to look at how the roads are maintained, how drug approval occurs, it's typically a relatively seamless process if not without its clunks and and, uh, delays, but it moves along at at least often a known pace and predictable pace. So if I have a corporation that's operating a, a drug manufacturing facility in Norway and I need approval to continue to produce certain drugs, I at least know who to contact. I know they're going to be relatively reliable. I know what to fill out on the form and I roughly know how long to wait and how the decision is going to be made. That's a very important thing for ease of doing business and thus for prosperity, and thus for the standard of living of all the people that live around me. And good news, countries with a high state capacity, like the United States, for example, when they have to fight wars, which is kind of what this is about, they're typically really good at it, much better than developing countries. Examples of what I would term modern countries or more modern countries are pretty much all the Nordic countries, Switzerland, Canada, the USA, Australia, New Zealand, Taiwan, Japan, most of the EU, Germany, Poland, etc., Thailand, South Korea, and the list could go on and on because there are very many countries, thank fucking God, that are modern in today's world. These are also generally places that like, if you think about going as a tourist, nobody tells you that's a bad idea. Like you're not going to get to hear a lot of people saying, oh, you want to go to Japan? Dude, don't go, man. That place is fucked up. You're just never going to hear that or very rarely or just from insane people. So these are places that I would argue are, in a certain sense, objectively better than those other places. Modernity is objectively better. Thus, you're willing to argue against peace, freedom, prosperity, and air conditioning. So we have defined, as I said earlier, that we want a modern alliance, right? We've defined modernity. What is the modern alliance then? It's a military alliance between pretty much all or most modern countries, led by the most powerful of them by far, the United States of America. And these countries are countries between whom state-to-state public relations, free trade, and tourism is at least very high, if not basically completely maxed out. Like, I live in America. If I want to go to Canada, I just cross the border. And the border patrol is like, what are you coming to Canada for? You're like, I don't know. Toronto seemed cool. They're like, all right, see you later. And they just let you go. Nobody gives a shit. You want to come back to America? Again, nobody gives a shit unless you're like doing crazy shit. You have like 20 pounds of heroin in your backpack or some shit like that. Then they're going to care. So these kinds of countries, all of whom tend to relate very well to each other, like Thailand and South Korea are not planning a war against each other you'll notice that the same relationship is not true between developing countries, many of whom are, well, uh, can get quite easily upset at each other and get into a whole bunch of bullshit. These countries are the better places of the world, places we want the rest of the world to be more like. Yes, I'm very, very okay making that value judgment. I would also say it's free from culture because if you have a culture that thinks clitoridectomy is okay, You're just wrong, and I'm totally cool saying that. Now, to keep the world better, because some people in the world are not good actors and they don't want modernity, we need to have strong allied militaries to keep the world better. But we don't want to just invade all the other countries and make it so there's no nations and just one world government like the WEC people and Joe Biden want Trump 2051. That's right. Trump's going to make it so that we have election years that are odd numbers. National sovereignty is important as well. It's not some world government crazy bullshit I'm on to. Why is national sovereignty important? Because unchecked power is a very bad idea by at least two methods of analysis. One, history. And two, game theory. One world government with no nations is something that might be able to be something we do in the future, but it's probably a bit premature. At the current rate At the current level of global development, I would say that we need zero countries and one world government, kind of like we need zero individual players on a basketball team. 
individuals are the ones who get it done. And their unique features can actually be virtues to the team. We don't want to wipe out all the countries of the earth. We just want to make sure everyone's getting along really well. And some people want national sovereignty because they just don't want to live with other people just quite yet. Sometimes it's for lame and totally xenophobic reasons. They just don't like the color of your skin or that weird accent that you smell funny, that your food looks weird. And that's fucking lame. And it's honestly just on the descent and has been for kind of all of measured history. But some folks just are persnickety and fine, fuck them, leave them alone in their own fucking country. But sometimes it's for really normal reasons. Like, I don't want those other people coming to our country because those people commit a lot of crime and I'm not interested with living with them and until they kind of fucking calm down, which is like a really reasonable take. You know, you'll see a lot of the statistics on, for example, the influx of immigrants from the Middle East, uh, refugees to places like Germany, and their crime rates are like, I don't know, order, an order or two of magnitude higher than the local population. It's understandable why the local population could be like, can we, can we, can we like reassess why those people are coming over here? Because it's, it's causing a lot of, of suffering for, for the local people. And it's a very complex topic with all of its nuances, but you can understand where people are coming from, that they still want their own nations so they don't just let in everyone that wants to come in because there's some people in the world that want to come in and do some bad. And very importantly, having sovereign countries is very important for global progress. Why? Each country, just like each state in the United States, for example, on the margins, try some slightly different policies. And over time, some countries just have more success than other countries. And we can analyze all the countries trying all the policies all at the same time and see what kind of trends emerge. And we can learn the best ways to run countries and adopt them. For example, capitalism versus communism has been a natural experiment, quote unquote, that has occurred, geez, at least 15 to 20 times, depending on how you make the count, over the course of just the 20th century. And capitalism is writ large, undefeated. Communism is just worse in any way you want to interpret what communism is. It's just worse. And so now when someone's like, we should have a communist country here in France or Germany or the United States, at least other people could be like, but that seems to not work out so well. If we just had one world government and we all had one policy to follow, we are making the fatal conceit that we know what the best policy is. But diversity is a good thing and we can have at least subtly different policies different ways of regulating or not regulating the economy, different ways of handling environmental regulation. And we see how does that promote cleanliness? How does that promote prosperity? And then we pick and choose the policies over the long term that seem to be the best. That's a pretty good thing and a very big advantage of at least some degree of national sovereignty. And especially if we have regulated but relatively open legal immigration to some extent, the most talented people end up going to the best countries anyway. And then, well, we don't really so much have to learn what's best. We just see that the people go to what they really like. And that's kind of a problem solved in and of its own way. The number of people that have run away from Hong Kong during the time that it was separated from mainland China borders on close to zero. And the number of people that ran away from mainland China to go to Hong Kong borders on close to everyone that possibly fucking could. So it tells you who's doing things right and who's doing things wrong, at least to some extent. Now, National sovereignty being very important has limits. It has boundaries. I can think of at least three boundaries to national sovereignty, limits to what a nation can do before other nations may decide to interfere. One, you can't attack other countries. Just like in a basketball team, you can't allow the players to fight each other. That does not lead to progress. It doesn't lead to points on the board. Countries fighting each other does not lead to global progress. Two, you're not allowed to shit where all of us eat. If you pollute your own country in such a way that only pollutes your own country, nope, fuck, fuck you, fuck your country. That sucks. We just won't go there. But if you violate global pollution standards that leach pollutants into the global water supply and the atmosphere, that's a problem because the rest of us have to deal with that shit. It's kind of like your roommate who lives with you. If he has a fucking total shit room, who gives a shit? But if his fucking clothes and dirt and gunk and fingernails start appearing in other parts of the house you're going to have a fucking problem as well you should. Now, the pollution thing is probably not a reason to go to war. It's usually dealt with sanctions. But remember, if a country gets persnickety about sanctions and starts to violate those, oftentimes war is something at least downstream that is threatened. And lastly, most people nowadays are of the opinion that you're not allowed to oppress or genocide people in your own country. I think we're beyond that as a world, or at least damn well should be, 
And uh, to me, the people getting oppressed, if they're human, enough is enough. So if there's some weird African country with weird African tribe number one oppressing weird African tribe number two, and you're like, fuck them, whatever, they're all fucking African and I'm not, and who gives a shit? Well, they're human beings, aren't they? And you're like, well, technically, yes. Well, fucking isn't that enough? I mean, like, you drive down the side of the road, you see a dog with a limp leg. Many people would get out of their car and try to help the dog. Do you know how many millions of years evolution were separated from the dog? All human beings are 99 point something else percent the same. We're all literally like genealogically brothers and sisters here. And so when someone's getting the shaft, fuck, man, that kind of sucks. We should probably not allow that sort of thing if we are capable of sleeping at night whatsoever. It doesn't have to mean you're a bleeding heart, but just something for consideration. Now, figuring that out, we move on to the question of why global security is important. Like, why do modern countries have to police the world? Many people will just say, just why don't modern countries police themselves and let the world do what it might? I think that's a fine opinion, but the argument against that is that global security is important for at least three reasons. First, if you can't act right to the people in your own country, as let's say a governing body, and you're hurting tons of people, that's not secure for global security, because those people that you're hurting are in, drumroll, the globe. They live in the globe and they're not secure. Your liver doesn't look at your cancerous kidney and go, eh, fuck it. It's not me, but it's in the same body. And if we're in the same globe and we're all human, and we all seem to care about each other, probably a good idea to think if people are getting slaughtered en masse in a country, maybe we should do something about it. Second, if you can't act right to your neighbors, you're hurting both your own people and other people. And the world, we can see it, all the countries of the world are kind of one big team of humanity. Do you stand by as a captain of your basketball team while your guard fist fights your center during practice? Hell no. You break it up because violence is bad for everyone. And war makes all of us poor. War is a massive net drain on the global economy. If Russia and Ukraine stopped fighting right now, maybe they will have at the time of this video release, unlikely, um, it would just be better for literally everyone, especially Russia and Ukraine. No oh, shit, at this point, especially Russia, because they're just bleeding dry for the love of God. But it would just be better for everyone. War is terrible. War is development in reverse. And if other countries attack other countries, they had better fucking stop, is my contention. And lastly, there can be really systemic problems from misbehaving countries for all of humanity and life on Earth that can bubble up. For example, Russia's nukes, China's nukes, North Korea's nukes, international terrorism, which threatens everyone. All of these things threaten all people, or the vast majority of the globe at the very least, and thus are not things we want to be threats in the future. We want them gone as threats, and only the modern world united can make that happen. Because when not-so-nice people with not-so-nice intentions don't do what you say, if you don't have the power to back it up, if you're a pacifist with no teeth and no military, it doesn't matter what you say. You are now not in charge. Someone else is in charge. You are now a slave, if not dead. But if the world's modern countries have an alliance that has a fucking strong-ass military and puts the fucking hammer down when it needs to, the world can get to be a better place over time. That's what they did with Hitler, remember? Next, let's talk about the universals for security intervention. I think, personal opinion, like this whole fucking channel, I guess, modern allies should consider armed intervention if a country meets one of the following three criteria. Sorry, did I say three? Five criteria, but three major ones and two minor ones. First, that country is threatening and preparing to kill their own people realistic threats, or is killing or oppressing their own people. Mm. Three, so that was one and two. Three, the country is threatening or preparing to attack other countries, or four, is or has attacked other countries. And five, is supporting or allowing terrorist organizations to flourish in their own territories. Like, why did the United States attack the Taliban? After 9-11, because they were allowing Al-Qaeda to run free and just do whatever the fuck they want, which is 
not a good thing. And, you know, like Al Qaeda is attacking other people all around the world. Time for the Taliban to get the hammer. Right. This understanding of these kind of five rules in which military force may be appropriate is uh, actually quite simple. I would say it doesn't take a huge degree of moral calculus. It's almost exactly like a police force acts in its jurisdiction in a local town. Countries killing and oppressing their own people, we treat as domestic violence. If you beat the living shit out of your wife and your neighbors hear you beating her and she's screaming for help, the police are coming and they're going to fucking break down your door and know they do not need a warrant and they're going to beat that ass and drag you to jail as well they fucking should. So if you're killing and slaughtering your own people, you should be getting it. Countries plotting for war can be treated analogically as a conspiracy to commit violence. If your neighbors find out that you have a detailed designs on their imminent death, that's going to get you in deep shit. And so if a country finds out that another country is plotting to invade it, that should be cause for at least a threat of war by the modern alliance. And lastly, countries actually warring against each other is the analogy to street crime, murder, assault, theft, burglary, etc. That's the kind of stuff we do not tolerate in modern societies in a single town by a single police force. Why should we, vi- why should we allow for it in the world? The world's just one big town. Why are we allowing this kind of thing? I think we shouldn't. And for that reason, I propose a model here of how to handle global security. The modern countries of the world should be allied and their armies should train together all the time is my contention. And the good news is this is already a huge thing with alliances like NATO and a bunch of Pacific alliances, etc. But more cooperation can be possible and I think should. Now with kind of the rise of Russia, China, Iran, even though those aren't really alliances in themselves, these new kind of state-level bad actors, there seems to be an emerging alliance between the freer countries of the world uh, on the Western Hemisphere and in the East, like Japan, Korea, etc. And I think that's kind of a good thing. It's a trend into the right direction. We had something like it when the Soviet Union and the free countries of NATO were the sort of poles of the world, and now China's kind of thrown into that mix. The 90s were kind of like, not everyone fend for themselves, but less of Team USA, Team NATO world police. Now it's getting back more to that, which obviously the the rise of a totalitarian China is a terrible thing, but the rise of a free alliance to counter it is, I think, a very good thing. More in that direction is my vote. Now, here's my model. When a country is threatening to kill people uh, or oppress them or it's doing it, I think the following things should happen. First, and probably always, it gets should get from the modern alliance a very clear communication of what to stop, how to stop it, like what it means to stop it, and a deadline, very clear deadline of by when to stop it. This is hugely important because it is a ton of transparency. And it is a transparency on threats of action and on action itself. This is what you should stop. And if you don't stop it, this is what we're going to do to you. This is a really good thing for many reasons, but one of them is that it cuts out all the conspiracy theories and accusations of political moves or motives. If it can be demonstrated very clearly, so for example, why did the United States go and form an alliance, or maybe that's a, re- a poor retelling of history, why was an alliance made to go kick Saddam Hussein the fuck out of Kuwait in 1991? Because he invaded Kuwait. And then he was given a very clear deadline of, I believe, either January 15th or 17th, one of the two, uh, to be like, look, if you don't get out of Kuwait until uh, at this point, we're going to come fuck you up. That is awesome. And if someone's like, well, you know, these countries had ulterior motives, like they may have had additional ulterior motives, but their proximate motive was very obvious. Saddam Hussein decided to take over Kuwait. Wrong answer. It was told very clearly, don't do this. Go back, recede. And if you don't, we're going to fucking smash you. And that's exactly what happened. If you are doing wrong as a country, it's made very clear to you why and what will happen and when up front. So we can all be on the same page about what is wrong about this, what can be done to alleviate this, and if that does not happen, what will be done to you uh, if that does not happen. Now, if that country doesn't cut it out 
then military action, I propose, should be considered against it. Military action can occur in a couple of different ways. First, it can be to cleanse the terror elements of a country. So in Libya, there's tons of terror cells. We go in, the government isn't dealing with them. They can't or won't do it themselves. We go in there, we fuck up a bunch of the terrorists, and we leave. Um, I suppose this happened in Iraq with uh, the uh, ISIS alliance. That the militaries of the world, the modern alliance, went in there and just fucking killed so many ISIS people. They just don't have enough people to lead anymore, and they're really not a functional organization anymore. Problem solved. Next, it can be to destroy the military machine or severely degrade it and go back to negotiations. So that means a good example of that is the 1991 Gulf War. Saddam Hussein had a military machine with which to invade other countries. After about one month of the 1991 Gulf War, he no longer had that machine. It was just destroyed. Not completely, but so, so, uh, to such a huge extent that uh, there's just, he was almost powerless. Alternatively, and this is, gets a little bit more icky and sticky, you can destroy a military machine so much that another faction is empowered to overthrow the government. That gets icky, but sometimes that faction is the more modern faction, and they do better than the faction that was there before. It gets tough because a lot of factions have equally bad ideas about what to do after. So it's tough. And uh, lastly, the military power of the modern alliance can be potentially used to decapitate the government. There's a big problem with that because then it's what do you replace the government with? Uh, we decapitated Saddam Hussein's government uh, during the 2003 uh, Iraqi Freedom Operation. And then what, what was there instead is a really, really not great thing. It's getting a little better now, but it was a really, really tough road for a long time. Nation building is a very, very tough. We will actually chat about that in hopefully our next video. I already have that presentation written up. So I'll talk about my uh, ideas of what nation building should and should not look like. And I will, again, continue my attempt to sacrifice myself to the internet by taking further politically incorrect uh, opinions that everyone hates. So I'll actually be supporting the idea of nation building, crazy as it sounds, uh, in my next video, Yahoo. All right, let's wrap this up. All the implications all at the same time. Here are kind of my main points. Violence is not okay. It's not okay between individuals, and we do not tolerate it in modern societies between individuals, and it sure shit should not be okay between groups or between countries. As modern peoples, I think we should give a serious thought to stopping violence everywhere that we can, and with our way superior militaries, we actually can stop violence almost everywhere. This does require kind of a feminine care for the world energy that conservatives often don't have a lot of stomach for, but it also requires a masculine hurt who needs to learn energy that leftists of the world don't really like, but conservatives think is pretty awesome. So there's a bit of both camps that kind of bleed into this and a bit of both camps that won't agree with this. I don't call it masculine or feminine. I just call it doing the right thing. Preventing violence that is needless and is unjust is almost always doing the right thing. Because I want to live in a world where there's more places like Canada and fewer places like Afghanistan. So if we can keep Canada free and we can make Afghanistan freer at some fucking mysterious juncture, maybe I'll try to cover that in my next video, that would be awesome. So yes, I think the modern alliance should police the world. And if we're going to have a multipolar world like Mr. Putin wants, then maybe Mr. Putin can start also policing the world instead of just selling arms to everyone and profiting off that shit, and God knows what the fuck he's up to. Hopefully he's dead soon. See you guys next time.